Okay, hello friends. We are today going to talk more about minimum spanning trees. So this topic was introduced last time and we kind of talked about Prim's algorithm um, as a first example of greedy algorithms. And uh, then in class, we really learned, got more experience with thinking about the greedy algorithm design paradigm and what that's all about with that scheduling example that we saw. So now we're going to get back into MSTs. We're going to look at two algorithms today. Um, so prims, which we've already seen, but we'll see the correctness. Why um, is it always optimal? Remember that that's really the big challenge with greedy algorithms. We can get them to run fast without too much difficulty, but um, getting them, proving that they always return the optimal solution is tougher. And then we'll look at a different MST algorithm called Kruskal's, um, which is a slight variation, slightly different than Prim's, and it has some advantages. And so um, it's kind of interesting to look at that other way of solving it. So just as a reminder about Prim's algorithm is it's starting from some vertex in the graph, like vertex A, and then it's always going to take the least weight edge from the current tree so far. So here it'll take this weight one edge to join in with C, and then it's looking at all the neighboring edges of any of these. Okay, weight one is the least one out of those. Then it's looking at all the edges connecting these three nodes to the rest of the graph. Okay, there's another weight one edge, so there we go. And now it's looking at everything connecting these, and we have two weight two edges, so we could go with either one. Let's go here, and then finally we'll go here to get D. So we get this um, minimum spanning tree. It's a tree because it's a connected graph with no cycles, and it's spanning because it touches every, um, every node in the graph. Now, when we're thinking about proving the correctness, there's a very, very useful concept that's called edge contraction. And the idea of edge contraction is I'm going to take two nodes, once I've kind of uh, joined them, if, you, if, you, if we go back to the beginning of this algorithm, once I, the first two nodes that I joined were A and C. So once we join them, they're really kind of acting like one unit. Um, they're really kind of like one mega node that's now we're exploring the connection from that mega node to the rest of the graph. So when we join up A and C in this first step of the algorithm, we can think of that with edge contraction, we can think of that as, as if we're really transforming into a new graph where we have one like AC node that's just one thing with that edge between them that we took is, is collapsed. And then all the rest of the nodes are, are just like they were. And all the edges between these other nodes are just like they were before. So this, and then finally, all the edges from A or C to any of these other nodes are now there. Okay, so we just did an edge contraction that transforms this graph into this one. And where now we're saying, okay, from starting point of AC, what would be the next edge to take is of course this weight one edge that goes up to B. And so now the next transformation, really in the graph, we're just making this connection to B and adding that to the minimum spanning tree. But if we think of it in terms of edge contraction, then what we've really done is made now our mega node got even bigger. So I'll say ABC. Now all three of those are combined. And then we have Okay, so we're just like, every time we take an edge, we can think of it as instead of adding an edge to the tree, which is really what we do algorithmically, and in terms of like implementing it, we can think of it, it's equivalent to think of it as contracting um, the edge we picked and making like a bigger mega node. And I hope you notice that what happens when we think of it in terms of edge contraction is that, okay, originally we were starting from node A, and that was like our starting point, and we picked the least weight edge from there. Well, when we contracted it now, it's really just a, another instance of exactly the same algorithm, is that we're starting from this one mega node, AC, and picking the least weight edge from there, which is this weight one edge to B. So what this edge contraction idea allows us to do is to conceptually say that really every step of the algorithm is the same thing. Every step of this Prim's algorithm is saying, take one node, which is maybe 
you know, a designated node from the original graph where it's like a mega node of what we've constructed so far and add in the least weight edge from that node to any other spot in the graph. Okay, let's talk about the correctness of Prim's algorithm. And because of the technique of edge contraction, then we really only have to care about, I think this is cut off, um, whether approving that for any single vertex, the, mo the minimum spanning tree always contains the least weight um, edge connected to that vertex. So the idea of this proof is always going to be we start with some optimum solution. So let opt be any mini be um, a valid like minimum spanning tree of the graph. And then what we want to prove is that the least weight neighboring edge from V is always part or can be part of this minimum spanning tree. Um, so the idea is going to be to how can we convert opt so that it always has this least weight neighboring edge. So before talking about that, let's, let's maybe look at a picture to help us understand. So here's a graph. I'm not, I'm not writing any weights on it, um, but some graph and, and I have this one vertex V that I care about. So of course, if, uh, if the, the edge that we care about is already in this opt, then we're done. Um, so let's say, so if the least weight neighboring edge, so LWNE means least weight neighboring edge of V is in opt, then we're already done because that means that that's, that's what we wanted to, to say that it always has to contain V's least weight and every edge. Otherwise, what we have to do is we have to transform this optimum solution into one that has the least weight neighboring edge. And so that's what we want to think about. How can that work? Um, so let's imagine a tree within this graph that doesn't have the least weight neighboring edge. So I'm going to say that this is W1. So like this is the um, least weight neighboring edge LWNE from V. So that's this one down here. And we imagine some tree that I guess we're going to say is a minimum spanning tree, which doesn't contain that edge. So maybe it looks like this and something here it might go down to that one and uh, another edge up here. Okay. So we have these these red edges form some opt um, minimum spanning tree, but it doesn't contain the least weight. Oh, I <laughs> I missed. Um, see this. See I missed something because this this node down here is not part of the tree at all right now. So that has to be connected somehow. Let's say it's connected right here. So I think now I actually have a spanning tree, and so let's say that's the minimum spanning tree and doesn't contain the edge that we say has least weight. So the question is, how can we transform the optimal solution that we're given into one that has the greedy choice, that has this least weight neighboring edge? And the way to do that is we just add in the least weight neighboring edge. When we do that, so we'll add in the least weight neighboring edge. When we do that, what you should notice is that we get a cycle. We're always going to get a cycle. Why? Because it was a tree. So a tree is like the the a minimally connected graph, meaning that there was already a connection between these two nodes since it's a tree. Now we've added a second connection by adding this new edge that has to introduce a cycle. But now along that cycle, what you should notice is that along that cycle, so here's the, I'll just highlight the cycle in blue for a second. So here's the cycle that we just created. And along that cycle, there's another edge from V. There has to be another edge from V because it's a cycle. We added one edge from V. There has to be another edge from V along the same cycle. Otherwise, it wouldn't be a cycle. So that means that what we can do is actually cut out the other edge from V. So I'm going to call this in blue. This is like the other edge from V. So we'll add in the least weight neighboring edge. We'll subtract the other edge. So I'm going to remove this one from the tree. And now what I get is another tree. So if you look at the red edges, except for the one that we removed, plus the green edge, the least weight neighboring edge that we added in, 
what we have is another tree. So anytime you, for any tree, if you add an edge, you create a cycle. When you remove any other edge on that cycle, you get back to having a span of a spanning tree. So we have another spanning tree here, but what you should also notice is what's the weight of this spanning tree? Well, we removed, we added our least weight neighboring edge and we removed another neighboring edge from V. But we know that this one, the least weight neighboring edge, the green edge that we added in, has to be less than or equal to in weight than the one that we removed. So this has to have less than or equal to the weight of the original optimum solution. So what we've done is we've said, if you give me any optimal solution that doesn't have my greedy choice, I can turn it into another spanning tree that has less than or equal to the size of that first one. So in terms of the proof, what we say is that um, if the optimum solution does not contain our least weight neighboring edge, so then otherwise um, opt must contain another edge from V in a cycle with the least weight neighboring edge. So then swap them and you get another uh, minimum spanning tree. Because I know that when I swap two edges on the cycle like that, it's always going to make another spanning tree. And since I swapped with the least weight neighboring edge, then that new spanning tree must have less than or equal to the weight of the first one. So it must also be an optimal spanning tree. And then that proves the thing which we really wanted to say, which is that um, a minimum spanning tree always has to contain the least weight neighboring edge. So that's it for correctness of Prim's algorithm. Um, so now to think about the analysis in terms of running time, it really depends on the data structure. So uh, it really, uh, this algorithm is exactly the same, exactly the same. We already mentioned this last class, but um, as Dijkstra's. So everything you know about Dijkstra's, I'm not even going to, to fill this in. We know that Dijkstra's either costs theta of m log n, if we have an adjacency matrix and a sparse graph, I'm sorry, an adjacency list representation of a sparse graph, or is big theta of n squared, if we use that other version where we have a, a dense graph and we use an adjacency matrix. And so these are the two running times of Dijkstra's. They're gonna be exactly the same as Prim's. Why? Because Prim's algorithm is exactly doing the same thing as Dijkstra's. The only difference is the weights that we associated with each edge. All right, now let's talk about Kruskal's algorithm. Um, it's a different greedy algorithm for the same problem. So what we saw with that scheduling problem in class was that there was multiple kind of greedy strategies, but most of them didn't work. We had to do the earliest finishing time first. That's the only greedy strategy that worked for that one. Um, but it turns out for minimum spanning trees, it's kind of a cool problem where multiple greedy strategies give the optimal solution. Uh, so the second one is called Kruskal's algorithm or Kruskal's algorithm named after another researcher. And these are both like early, early on, I think, I think maybe even in the late 1950s uh, in the history of, of computing when people started wanting to s solve these problems. Um, so you start your tree with, a, with an empty tree with nothing in it. And then we're gonna add the least weight edge, but we're not starting from a particular vertex. We're just looking for the least weight edge in the whole graph. And the only rule is that um, we have to check that our edge doesn't introduce a cycle. Okay, so we're not starting with a particular vertex like we do with Dijkstra's algorithm and with Prim's algorithm, um, but we start anywhere in the whole graph wherever the smallest weight edge is. So let's see how this works. Uh, in this example graph, um, what are we going to add first is going to be whatever the least weightage is in the whole graph. And so here that happens to be this one of weight three. So this will be the first thing that we add to the minimum spanning tree. Okay, great. Now next, we add the next least weight edge. And so it could be this four over here or this four over here. Um, four is the next smallest weight. And so I'll add this one. And each time we're just adding a new edge uh, notice that it's not necessarily connected. That's okay. It will be connected eventually by the time we get to the end. 
And what we're checking each time we try to add an edge is that it doesn't create a new cycle. So then we'll add this other four over here. So now we have kind of two pieces, one piece down here and one piece up here. The next least weight edge would be this one of length five, but look, that connects two nodes which are already part of the same component. So this would create a cycle if we added that. And so we don't add it, we skip five. And now let's say the next the smallest weight is this one of length six up here. So we add that next, that doesn't create a new cycle. Now we have two components and um, we really just need one more edge to connect them. And the next smallest edge is weight eight. And indeed that's what's gonna connect these to give the minimum spanning tree the whole thing. If you look back from your notes from last time, this is the same example that I used uh, when we presented prims in the last video, and it's the same tree that we get out of it. So this isn't a minimum spanning tree, um, but the order in which we pick the edges was different. Um, so the first thing we have a, a algorithm like this, we should think about, is it actually correct? One of the coolest things is, so I'll give you, if you wanna think about how do you know that this is correct, you might want to pause and think about that for a second. How do we know that it's always gonna give us the optimal solution. And the answer is that we can use exactly the same reasoning as prims. So if we do edge contraction, right, so the idea that every time we choose an edge, we imagine that we kind of collapse those two vertices with it, then what are we doing at every step is just choosing the least weight edge in the whole graph. Well, the least weight edge in the whole graph is definitely the least weight edge that's adjacent to some vertex in the graph. And then the same theorem tells us that the least weight edge um, is always part of some optimal minimum spanning tree. So the same theorem that we already proved, which said that for any vertex, the least weight edge from that vertex is always part of an optimal MST. Um, now, here we're basically choosing the least weight edge in the whole graph. Well, if it's the least weight edge in the whole graph, then it's definitely the least weight edge that's adjacent to some vertex. And so that's it. The same theorem tells us that that greedy choice that we make of the least weight edge in the whole graph is always part of some optimal minimum spanning tree. Uh, but then it gets more interesting when we think about the data structure idea. So I don't wanna um, get too hard into this because it's, it's really a data structures topic. Um, but the, the data structure that we use is interesting here because what do we have to do at each step is we have like a new edge that we're considering and we have to know whether the two vertices on either end of it, whether those are currently um, in the same like component of the tree that we're building so far or whether they're in different components. And this is a studied thing. It's, it has a name, it's called a disjoint set data structure. So there's three operations. Uh, first, when we want to create like a new disjoint set data structure from the items, that's going to be like creating um, size one mini trees, create like n size one sets. So originally, we're going to start out with each node just by itself. That's with the create step. The find step is says um, which set is x in. So given some node, we wanna find out which component is that node currently in. And then the union is to connect um, two, two sets into a larger set. So it's exactly the things that we're doing here. We start out by creating every node by itself. Then whenever we want to check whether we can add an edge, we do a find from each endpoint to see if they're in the same component already. And if they're not, then we do a union to connect the two um, components from either endpoint. And there's a number of ways that you can solve this. Um, and I think towards the end of the class, we might come back and see an even more sophisticated way, but we have data structures that can already solve this. I think the simplest way is to use a hash table of lists. So we'll use a hash table of lists. So what does that mean is that um, from every, so every list will be like pointed to potentially by multiple spots in the hash table. So each lookup uh, find returns the list for that set for that component. And the union is going to add the smaller 
list to the larger one. And that smaller list, that's the only kind of a little bit subtle idea that we need for this data structure. And if you think about why that's important is that you might do a union with like one huge set, so one huge component and then one like single vertex thing. And if you were to add the larger set to the smaller one, that would cost um, linear time in the larger set and it would end up um, that the unions would cost uh, potentially like quadratic time at the end of the day. But when we always add the smaller one, what that means is that um, the total cost of doing all the unions is going to be total cost of all unions until everything is all together is only going to be big O of n time. And so that's pretty good. Um, that's what we wanted. And it's going to work relatively well um, with this uh, union and find thing going on. And now, um, so we, we just kind of talked about this. Um, how many times do we do all these operations? The, the problem here is really that uh, the really it's the cost of sorting. So the issue, so I'm going to just like ignore everything I have written here. Um, so just forget about this for the second. Um, the issue is actually not with the union find data structure. The issue is with sorting. Because before I can even use this disjoint set data structure to try to connect things. The issue is that I have to first sort um, the edges, the edges by weight, because I have to, or I could make a, a heap or something, but either way I need to like get the edges in order from the least to the greatest weight. Because remember Kurzweil's algorithm is gonna start with the least weight edge in the whole tree and then consider the next least weight edge and the next least weight edge. Um, so we can have this awesome fast uh, disjoint jet set data structure and we might talk about that more later, but it's kind of useless until we can sort faster. And so the total cost of this one is also gonna be m log n which is really just from sorting the edge weights. So sorting the edge weights kind of dominates the whole cost and then we can use some fancy disjoint set data structures, but uh, it doesn't matter unless we know a faster way of sorting the edges. So it ends up with the same running time as like the sparse version of Prim's algorithm. And, uh, but it has some advantages in that if we know a way of doing sorting faster, then we can potentially do um, the whole data structure thing faster. And so we might, talk about that a little bit later in the class. Um, so just to kind of wrap this up, what did we just see? We saw Prims and Kruskal's uh, that both utilize the greedy algorithm. The greedy algorithm is this idea of adding one um, piece to the puzzle at every step along the way. And they also depend on um, data structures. So with greedy algorithm, the challenge is to prove optimality. And that part is not really going to get any better. Once you have a greedy strategy that you know is giving you the optimal solution, you want to stick with that strategy. It's, um, there's not a lot more to think about. But to make things faster, it's really going to be about improving the data structures. So there's kind of a greedy paradigm that we're talking about of this, like what we saw on the scheduling problem as well, which you, many of you employed in the first project um, of kind of making your choice based on short-sighted information and then sticking with it, never backtracking. Um, but there's also algorithms which heavily depend on data structures. So like we also saw another example of this concept in, in heap sort. And by we, I mean you saw this in your data structures class. So that's another example where it's an algorithm, it's doing something algorithmic like sorting a list but the way it's doing it is by using the heap um, data structure. And so if you want heap sort to be faster, you really need to get a faster heap. So it's no longer really an algorithms problem. Now it's a data structure design problem. Same with, uh, you could say with Kruskal's algorithm that in order to make Kruskal's algorithm faster, it really depends on that sorting problem and on the um, disjoint jet set data structure. So it's no longer about the, um, it's no, no longer really about minimum spanning trees, it's about this data structure thing going on. And so that's another um, kind of way of solving problems that's kind of like another paradigm, another way to approach problem solving 
is to say, we have some great data structures, maybe we can use them um, to help us solve this problem. And then you, you're kind of turning an algorithms problem into a data structures problem. We, then you have the advantage is that there's a lot of well-studied, effective, um, well-implemented data structures that are out there for you to use. Okay, and that's it for today. Hope this was fun. I'll see you next time.